So how do you approach like a digital transformation? And maybe uh, you could use like case studies from your current gig. Um, like how do you approach selling textile mills and, and manufacturing plants to integrate payments, uh, it, payment systems? What were the challenges that you found? And I guess maybe like some high level like frameworks that you use when you're approaching a problem like this so that you don't prematurely like solution vanilla software interfaces and you just tell them like, oh, okay, like here, here's how you use it. Like we have, we're going to educate you on how to use it, but how do you just make it more intuitive and. Yeah, for sure. It? Well, for starters, at least the messy middle right now tends to be kind of largely served, um, by the large banks. Um, you know, they've got faster payments, uh, which is great because you typically bank with them and they say, Hey, would you like to do some, some, you know, payment processing and, and we'll do it for you and we'll deposit the money pretty quickly. Um, but the support tends to be terrible, uh, and the hardware tends to not be any better. Um, so, so generally technology hasn't incorporated into the kind of messy middle as much. Um, I like to kind of take the approach of like, you know, the old Carnegie method, which is, um, rather than trying to pitch them any sort of solution, um, they are acutely aware uh, of their existing problems with their payment providers. Um, a lack of transparency in terms of fees because they might have seen a contract and someone's not in. Oh, they remember uh, when they couldn't get the support and they couldn't take payments for you know several days on end. Oh, they remember. Um, so uh, we've done, let's say, um, a campaign recently around opening ourselves up to uh, integrating partners uh, and trying to get people to integrate with our systems um, that are, let's say, a little bit on the, let's say, the medium of small to medium enterprises. And they reach out to us and we, you know, we pretty quickly find out, like, what's the existing problems with their existing payment provider. And usually the two most compelling things that they bring up are terrible support. Um, because they've got, they, it either doesn't exist and, and that still exists right now on Strike and Square. They, they make it very hard to call you. Um, or, um, they sneak in a whole lot of fees and they're not transparent. And, you know, those are not two, um, super defensible moats, you know, having good support necessarily. I mean, from a marginal spend, it is, you know, I, I truly appreciate Stripe's uh, approach to like, it's going to be so good. You won't need to call. But if you're a medium sized enterprise, you will have issues and then you're going to get someone on the phone. So, so they appreciate those things a whole lot. So, you know, we tend to kind of jump in and, and map out the processes and, and try to understand, like, is this something that can, you know, fit for you and their, um, their setups, especially the kind of marketplaces or the aggregators where, you know, they're doing customer and they're trying to aggregate some sort of level of support. Um, I like to think wherever I'm working, I'm kind of like. Uh, the old Avis campaigns of the 60s and 70s, where I will admit I'm second place, but I will try harder. Um, so, you know, hopping on the phone with people, mapping out a flow, trying to come up with, let's say, some creative solutions that, you know, it, it's back to that latent need as, a, 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 you know, as opposed to an express need. Um, so trying to map out flows, trying to identify the kind of laws hanging through, and, and also trying to iterate, which is like, look, maybe you really want to... Um, Everyone wants a Ferrari and everyone wants a white label. Most people, especially in the payment space, are not going to pay for white label. So what I'll try to do with any potential client, whether it's a you know, medium sized business or kind of internal teams is, uh, I've got three versions of everything that we want to do. We've got the scooter. What's the bare minimum that's going to get the job done. It might be uncomfortable. It might not, you know, have the longevity that you need, but great. So you'll find that end of the spectrum. And then what's your Ferrari? What's like your kind of dream state of like, what does this look like? And then you're probably going to land somewhere with a third option in the middle, which is your Honda Civic. It's, you know, 80% of the value for 20% of the price. If, if you really put the constraints on, on time or budget, you really find out exactly what those kind of value par points are and trying to deliver some of the, some solution that is a Honda Civic. Um, so trying to find those kind of marginal value adds, um, you know, especially as we're a, uh, you know, a, a small company you don't necessarily have the, the heft of Microsoft. Um, so, so trying to find that middle ground and any sort of option that they're looking for. Yeah. It, and what's pretty common with most of these, um, 
businesses like manufacturing, supply chain, construction is they don't need a Ferrari. And so a lot of companies that fail when trying to serve these types of businesses is we try to go for like consumer grade software that performs well, is opinionated, but at the end of the day, they just need the Honda Civic. But right today you can only give them the scooter and you know, when you take a scooter, you might get where you want to go, but it's going to take forever. You're gonna be sweaty when you get there. Um, and so it's like, okay, let's fix the sweat problem and stuff next and then work your way to this, the Honda Civic. Uh, another, no, whenever I like, cause I'm all, like, I'm passionate. Like, I don't think I ever want to work for like a SaaS company, um, in this, in like the sense of like selling licenses, but like using, um, software to digitize and like improve like legacy industries has always been something that's super fascinating to me. One thing that I've found was super powerful was just using a service blueprint fit framework where you try to map like the back office with the front office, with the customer, what the customer touch points are. And then you try to link the operations through backend systems and like front facing systems. And that gives you a holistic view of like what the service is trying to do like today to fulfill that service. And then you realize a lot of like the, the quick wins to actually fulfill that service are just like paper shuffling, like data formatting, making sure that it gets to the right place. They're not super comp. It's not like rocket science, super complicated problems yet. Like the end requirement. And, uh, when I was actually talking to an operations leader who was frustrated with like a product management, uh, group at the time, he's just like, we just asked, we just wanted the wall painted blue. And they're like, oh, cool. Let's build a tower. Right. And you just want the wall painted blue. Like when the outcome is so fundamentally simple and you, it could be done with like a make, make.com account and some Google sheets, technically, you know, that's not the most scalable solution. Like why, why do product people drop the ball so much when you just need a, the wall painted blue? I mean, in a lot of cases, it's, it's responding to those express needs. Right. But do they understand the cost and complexity to that? Um, I see it a lot with, especially when working with, um, with larger kind of enterprise customers and then some previous companies, um, they want white label, but they don't necessarily understand the business model of a technology company, which is I need to build this once and use it as many use cases as possible. So if you really understand your customer's needs, uh, well, first of all, yeah, you need to figure out, at least for the one customer, like what do they actually need and trying to respectfully challenge that's hard with the power dynamic, especially about PM talking to someone that's a potential customer and not wanting to ruin the deal and, 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 and wanting to be, uh, wanting to be agreeable, but at the same time, it's uncomfortable, but they'll be a lot happier if you can challenge them, if you can understand their process, even a simple process map. Because most people don't actually know their own processes. And even if they map it at themselves, they might realize, oh, wow, that's a lot of touch points. Is that actually necessary? Like, do I need to go through all those cycles? Oh, well, that's a process that existed. Like, well, what if it didn't? What if we changed that? Like, I like to do like a bit of a screen test, which is like, all right, I'm going to remove this process. We're going to do it in this way. Who's going to screen? And often it's actually no one. It's just, Hey, that's something that was set up by a former leader. It's going to involve some retraining, but you know, if, if the initiative is worth it, uh, it's very often worth retraining or, or coming up with a, a solution that it's, it's just like a technology company, high capital costs, low marginal costs. You spend the time, you know, in the beginning early to figure out a good system so that your marginal cost of doing that task or serving that customer is going to be as low as possible. And you can actually realize scale in a way that a lot of enterprise kind of B2B SaaS companies, they do bend to the wheel a little bit too much and that might get them the next customer, but it makes it a lot harder to serve the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, uh, after that. Yeah. I've noticed that when, when a lot of, uh, SaaS companies start losing their way, uh, it's because they start acting like a normal, like service business, but the, the cost of 
implementing any software architecture. Like this is why I, it, like it chaffs my hide when people say, oh, well, no, just fail fast. Just like hack stuff together, move fast and break things when most SaaS needs to be like a utility that just works. And also it's not that cheap to change software. Well, especially like maybe like an interface, it's cheap to do a, like update the front end, but like the architecture, like I've never seen an yeah. architect, re-architecture actually get fully prioritized.